Well, we're in the book of Proverbs, and we're going to address this evening chapters 10 through 14. Now, we had the first, what many people consider the first section of the book, the first nine chapters, obviously are behind us in their previous sessions. Wisdom and folly are contrasted in those sessions. Now we're entering that section which most commentators will just simply call the Proverbs of Solomon. And what they mean by that are the ones that he written and set in order by himself. There's a good chance, as you'll find out, uh, uh, Solomon wrote, what, 3,000 Proverbs and most of this book. In fact, possibly all of it, some under even some code names that we'll come to later. But uh, these uh, chapters, 10 through 24, are a, a set that he ordered himself. There's another group that will follow that that were pulled together by the men of Hezekiah uh, a couple of generations after uh, Solomon, but attributed to Solomon in any case. And uh, then we're going to have two chapters at the end that will be full of some surprises for you. I'll leave that be. But we're in the, uh, uh, the first half, in a sense, of the section called the Proverbs of Solomon within the book. And uh, Proverbs, the book itself, is God's handbook on how to wise up and live. And that sounds glib, but it really is. It's, it's, that's exactly what it's all about. It's not just practical wisdom by Solomon, which in itself would be valuable. He was deemed in the Scriptures the wisest man of his day. So hearing his, the kind of uh, precepts that he teaches his kids would be valuable. But no, no, this is far more than that. And these words are, are far beyond simply keeping rules or laws. And it focuses on leading an aggressively dynamic life. This is not a passive call to avoid this or avoid that. It's a call forward to get a full, rich life, as we'll see. And it deals with attitudes, not just keeping rules. And uh, it's encapsulated in these very little pithy capsules. He's using a rifle, not a shotgun here. And... Uh, they're, they're, it's quite a collection. Now, I want to remind you something that Paul highlighted to his protege, Timothy. He said, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Now, that's a glib phrase. What does that really mean? In the Greek, it means God breathed. We now know from computer analysis of the text, both Old and New Testament, that God had a, 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 a supervision of the very letters of the, of the, of the, uh, the text. The text reflects the style and the form of the writer, but the, it nevertheless is superintended by the God himself. For what reasons? To be profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, righteousness. What do those words mean? Doctrine tells you what's right. Reproof, what's not right. Correction, how to get it right. And instruction, how to stay right. So I, I throw that up there because we use those words pretty loosely but they are definitive and distinctive. And so I'll leave that with you as we go. Now, wisdom is traditionally the ability to use knowledge in the right way, and that's, that's man's knowledge. Biblically, it acknowledges there is a wisdom of this world, but there's a divine wisdom from above, and we're going to find this divine wisdom permeates these, uh, these uh, Proverbs that we're going to review. Now, there are three losers that surface throughout the book. Three class of losers. People who desperately need wisdom. The scorner, the fool, and the simple. Derogatory terms, but each one is d uh, distinctive in its own way. The scorners mock at God's wisdom because it's too high for them and they will not admit it. The Hebrew word for scorner literally means to make a mouth, and we can very well picture the smirk on the scorner's face. And they never profit from rebuke. And you know, it's interesting, as I've gone through 30-year executive career in corporate boardrooms, the CEOs, the chief executive officers that I've met, the real winners were great listeners. They didn't let their egos get in the way. They're all big ego guys for lots of good reasons, but at the same time, the winners never let that get in the way of hearing and measuring. And so the scorners... Don't pro are, do, are, not, are not like that. They, pro they don't profit from re a rebuke, and so one day they will be judged. And uh, the other group is the fool. That's a person who's dense, lazy, sluggish, careless, self-sustained. Self-sustained, key point, key word. 
Nabal is the word in Hebrew for the fool, and the, Nabal himself was a proper name of an exemplary fool in 1 Samuel 25 that we talked about. This is just all by way of review of our earlier sessions. So the fool hates instruction, is self-confident, talks without thinking. How many of you know a fool? Okay. Anybody without their hand up wasn't listening. And, uh, and he makes a mock of sin. Realize that's a package. Not only do they talk without thinking, but they also make fun of sin. We are all guilty of that. I catch myself in that too, sometimes in the, in the interests of some joviality, not taking sin seriously. Sin offends God. And when we joke about sin, we're showing a disrespect for God's prejudices and, 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 and attitudes. The third guy is the simple person. These are, the simple are those who believe everything and everybody and they lack discernment. Most of us think, gee, that sounds kind of innocent. We think of someone who's simple as sort of an innocent. Yes, but not if diligence is required. See, they're easily led astray and lack understanding. They cannot see ahead, and as a result, they repeatedly walk into trouble. How many people know somebody like that? You bet. I, I shave one every morning. <laughs> In contrast to those three, we have the wise. They listen to instruction. They obey what they hear. They store up what they learn. They win others to the Lord. They flee from sin. They watch their tongue and are diligent in their daily work. This list is a list that we could easily post on our bathroom mirrors. Everyone is not just a platitude. It's, there's actually a proverb that there's at least more than one. I just picked a, a seven of them here that are to exemplify the fundamentals. And any of you that have been in a sport, in a sport situation, you know what the coach, a smart coach focuses on day one are the fundamentals. Get the fundamentals right, the other things will fall into place. And so the results, the scorner rejects wisdom, met instruction. He listened to folly and received destruction. The fool rejected wisdom, was led to death. He listened to folly and received death. And the simple rejected wisdom, went to hell, and he listened, he listened to folly and ended up hell. So we have wisdom and folly portrayed rhetorically in the grammar as two women, each calling. And some follow wisdom, some follow folly. There is a verse we encountered in chapter 1, which many regard as a key verse. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You want to be smart? You want to be wise? Where do you start with an awe and a respect, a fear, healthy fear of the Lord? And, uh, but fools despise with instruction. We, will, we encountered in chapter 9, the end of that last section that we were through, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that's often quoted as the key verse of the entire book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. And there's nothing more important for us to understand. We can make a long list of things that it's necessary for us to understand about life. But the number one thing is to understand what the word holy really means and to recognize there is such a thing as holy and also to recognize we have no capacity to imagine what it really includes. Our problem isn't just our sin. Our problem is we cannot even grasp how the purity of a holy God. It's the gap that's the problem. Well, uh, we also picked up a verse along the way as I was, I was scanning the last sessions to figure out what do I throw into the review part of our thing tonight. I cannot dismiss Proverbs 3, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. These are uh, of, of the verses in the book of Proverbs, probably my favorite. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. Boy, that's a verse. God finds a new way every day to ask you, do you trust him? Big things, little things, whatever. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. What a promise that is. Boy, I don't know what God wants me to do. Well, he'll make it clear. You've got to trust him. If you acknowledge him in all your ways, he shall direct thy paths. How does he do that? How does he do that? By the word? By competent counsel of your Christian friends? By circumstances? All kinds of ways. It goes on to amplify that. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil, he, and it shall be health to thine evil and marrow to thy bones. So the, the first two verses, uh, th uh, 3, 5, and 6, are usually the standard for those of you that are committed to memory work. In chapter 5, we talked about last time about sexual purity. 
We emphasize that thou shalt not commit adultery includes all sexual sins, not just what we technically, denotatively might portray as adultery. All sexual, all sexual sins are prohibited elsewhere in the scripture. Our Lord spoke of fornications, plural, different kinds. The Council of Jerusalem included that in the, in the laws condemned by the law of Moses. And the words adultery and fornication are inclusive of all kinds of things. I just didn't want that to get by us here. Sexual sin will disappoint is the key uh, uh, theme of Proverbs chapter 5. The experience goes from sweetness to bitterness. And I like the way that Proverbs emphasizes that be, you should always check the destination before you buy your ticket. Find out where it's headed. And uh, from, it goes from gain to loss. Temptation always has promises that are never kept or otherwise people wouldn't take the devil's bait. Sin is the most expensive thing in the world. You go from purity to pollution. Sex within marriage is a beautiful river. It's interesting how not only the book of Proverbs, but other, uh, the uh, song of songs and so forth exemplify the erotic side of the married life. But sex outside marriage is, in contrast to that, a sewer, defiling everything it touches. And we talked about that, we developed that last time. This is by way of review here. It go, uh, sex, sexual sin goes from freedom to bondage, not the other way around. And it's the kind of bondage that can't easily be broken. Chapter 6 sh- seemed to shift gears and talk about business principles. And uh, we had a list of things that God hates. It's, it shocks many people to realize that God hates things. He's a God of love, yes, but he also has a list of hates. And what's number one on God's list of hates? A proud look. Look on everyone that is proud and bring him low to tread upon the wicked in their place. A lying tongue, that's a close cousin. I said to my said, all liars, deliver of my soul. And we don't have to develop all, this, all the verses again. I think it's pretty obvious that God is a God of truth. Third on his list, the hands that shed innocent blood. Heart that devises wicked imaginations. Feet swiftly running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that sows discord among the brethren. They're all close cousins. As you see the things God hates, they all have something in common. And that's basically a form of pride and deceit that derives from that. Proverbs 6 then closes again picking up the sexual sin theme. That sexual sin results in losses. The earlier part of that chapter dealt with business practices, but the last part points out that one of the ways you lose is through sexual sin. You lose the Word of God, you lose wealth, you lose enjoyment, and you lose, they lose their good sense, people who indulge in these things. And they also lose their own peace. And uh, so, but we want to remember as we go through these things, the Christian's bar of soap. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Whose faithfulness are we leaning on? Not ours, his. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins because he promised to and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He'll do the cleanup stuff. You do understand that a fisherman, the, the fish are cleaned after they're caught, not before, right? Okay. Chapter 7, The Lure of the Harlot. And here we talk specifically about whoredoms, the path to destruction. He, there are three things that tempts the young man that's there portrayed. He tempts himself, first of all. Then he's tempted by the woman. That seems straightforward. What shocks you, he also, he tempts the Lord. We often don't think about that third part. Compromise typically starts in our own heart, in our own, by the very fact that we might be in proximity of, of um, the temptation. That's where it starts. Then, of course, he's tempted by the woman who's uh, the instrument, uh, Satan's instrument in the fall here. But then, as he yields to all of that, he tempts the Lord. What do I mean by that? We tempt God when we deliberately disobey him and put ourselves in situations so difficult that only God can deliver us. That's exactly where we find ourselves if we go down this path. So we tempt ourselves, tempted by the woman. We also tempt the Lord. Now, in Hebrew hermeneutics, just to review that, there are four levels of meaning in the mind of a rabbi. Peshat is the direct, literal meaning of the text. The remez is the allegorical significance or maybe a hint of something deeper, and we're going to experience that when we get to chapter 30 especially. Then there's the darash. That's the practical personal application. That's the part that the minister takes Sunday morning to do a sermon around. Okay. 
But there's a fourth level. Now, these three have their correspondence in Christian hermeneutics. We probably put them in a little different order. The direct, the, uh, uh, the uh, homiletical, and we usually take the allegorical as the, as the last. But they, the, the Jews do it this way for some reasons. And then they have a fourth, they call it the sod. That's the mystical, hidden meaning of the text. And uh, they, re, they, they memorize these four by the word pardes, which means garden or paradise. But the point is, we have not dealt so far in the book of Proverbs in the remez or the sod level of meaning. We will before we finish the book. But we did encounter in a sod aspect of Proverbs 5, 6, and 7. It's one that I personally don't really embrace particularly, but in fairness to you, I thought I'd at least let you be aware of that our rabbis that see uh, in Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 recognize that Solomon is the collector of dark sentences. He loved enigmas, and it's very typical Solomon style to have hidden underneath the text another thing. The harlot may be, can be portrayed as Babylon, the Nimrod, the hunter of men, Simiramis and Tamas legends that led to all the, all the false uh, 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 forms of idolatry. Uh, Christmas, Easter, all that has its roots not in Christian things, but rather in previous pagan practices. And uh, fornication is also clearly throughout the Bible spoken of as spiritual and chastity. And to, to worship false idols is considered whoredom. And so some rabbis see in Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 a mystical level of meaning, which uh, basically there's nothing new in the New Age. It's simply a repackaging of the old Babylonian legends. And uh, from God's point of view, whoredom. So I'll, I'll leave that for you to... If you see it, great. If not, don't worry about it. Let's move on to chapter 8. This is, the, this is in some respects the dessert. We've gone through all the 5, 6, 7, all that stuff. We have Wisdom's chapter, which is a chapter that clearly portrays the person of Jesus Christ. And uh, he said so in Psalm 40. The volume of the book is written of me, he says. And um, I always love Edmund Spencer's quote. I use this a lot in our Bible studies. Because there, I call it the scorner's creed. You see, there is a principle which is a bar against all information. A proof against all argument. And it cannot fail to keep man in everlasting ignorance. What principle that could be? What principle is a guarantee that you'll stay ignorant? The principle is condemnation before investigation. See, the only barrier to truth is the presumption you already have it. So part of the thing you want to bring to any Bible study is to set aside presuppositions and listen to what the text is saying. And there's a number of places in the Bible where that's crucial, to really hear the text, not cloud it with traditions of man. And uh, so I, it's interesting as we get to Proverbs 9, verse 9, give instruction to a wise man and he will be wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. That's me. All through the New Testament you find this, he that has... He that has, to more will be given. He that has not, that will be taken, even that which he has. You listen, it sounds like double talk until you understand what, what's being portrayed there. God will give you some truth, and depending on what you do with it is, de- determines whether you get more truth or not. And uh, you teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Well, gee, if he's a just man, he already knows it. No, there's always, always more to learn. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy is understanding. And this, of course, is the key verse of the entire book. For by me thy day shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself, but if thou scornest, thou alone shall bear it. Ooh. So just to summarize, I threw the summary in here too because I thought it would capture the whole flavor of the first section of the book. We cannot avoid decisions. It's not voluntary. Your decisions you make determine your destiny. You can either choose the path of wisdom or the path of folly. That's the choice that is confronted the reader all through the book of Proverbs, from cover to cover. And, uh, if you, and you have that choice. You can't, you can't split it. You're going to be on one path or the other. And the question that you have to think about is, what decisions have you made? If you're a professional in, in, in uh, decision theory or game theory, you're familiar with risk analysis, or even if in, uh, there's a field of uh, mathematics called the design of experiments, you're tip- taking about reality or what may be really true, can, uh, something you're trying to investigate can either be true or false, and your attempt to, to, to sample that to, can give you a conclusion whether it's true or false. And obviously, if your approach is sound, if it's true, you find out it's true. And if it's false, you find out. That, that, that's clear. 
The problem is, suppose you're, the methods you're using cause you to reject that which is true. That's called in statistics a type 1 error, after naming Pearson and that crew. That's rejecting a true hypothesis. The other type of error is when you accept a false hypothesis. So obviously, determining a false, false, recognizing a false hypothesis as false is good, and if it's, if it's true, recognize it true is good. The real problem is, will you fall into the trap of a type 1 or type 2 error? Well, what you can do is you can analyze the implications of each one of those errors. And Pascal was famous for this. He said, let us assess the two cases. If you win, you win everything. And if you lose, you lose nothing. <laughs> that says it all, doesn't it? it says, don't hesitate then. You want to wager that God does exist and so forth. But anyway, uh, sin is always alluring. Folly, fo folly does everything she can to make sin look attractive, but she never re reveals her true nature. She never tells people that her house is on the way to hell. And the only way to detect folly is to walk with wisdom. So you want to examine wisdom to know where to go. Don't have to worry about examining folly. It's, it's, a, it's a losing proposition. And for those who walk with wisdom, obeying the word of God will not easily be tricked by folly. It takes time for judgment. Many people think, gee, I'm doing okay because nothing's wrong that's happened. Well, that, that's judgment eventually will catch up. What a man sows, that will he also reap. You find Galatians 6, 7 echoing all through the book of Proverbs. Satan always appears, appeals to the flesh. And uh, we don't have to develop this here. God continues to call, fortunately. But when sinners refuse to obey, they eventually become deaf to God's call. That's the scary part. Okay, some caveats. Let's, let's shift gears here a little bit. One of the things to recognize that we're going to see embody the book of Proverbs is a lot of experience, not simply the theological dogma. Some of Proverbs' assertions work may seem to be inappropriate for the world you and I live in. Some of these will sound kind of quaint. Well, gee, they probably worked great in Solomon's day. They, they, they're not too practical in today's world. One of the reasons you may feel that way is because they may reflect the wickedness of our world. I spent 30 years in the corp in, in public uh, boardrooms of public companies. That's been my primary executive career. And I have to tell you, I am absolutely shocked at the lack of ethics in the business world. Because even in Wall Street, where you might have had immoral men in the sense, ungodly men, they still had an ethic. My word is my bond. That's what made the financial structure of this country great for a century or more. But that's gone. The byword in the street now is so, you know, is so sue me. There'll be two guys negotiating a deal while their attorneys are suing over the previous one. That's just the way of the street today. You look at our politics. It's astonishing to see the carnal partisanship going on about our troops while we have put them in harm's way, that should be called treason. Yes, those debates should take place, but there used to be closed sessions for that, not where you're doing it for the TV cameras, because there's election year coming. Also about the Proverbs, the generalizations, we need to recognize that even in these, uh, among some of these Proverbs, there will be exceptions, and your challenge is to understand the generalizations and the exceptions, and take both into account. So there are no glib, simple answers on some of these. Now many of these, you need to recognize that the apparent injustices that are alluded to in this life are dealt with in other parts of the Scripture, and you can count on the fact that God is just, and that somehow it's going to be straightened out. You need to have the confidence not in the world, but in God's ultimate rulership of that world. If there's injustice in Satan's world, no surprise. But God is in the ultimate control. Now I want to share something else, because we're about to enter a portion of the book of Proverbs that will seem like a hodgepodge. The first nine chapters had some structure and order, and I tried to lean on some of that for your uh, help, hopefully. 
But there's also something else I'd like to encourage you to try. See, I, when I take a book, whether it's Daniel or Isaiah or whatever, the first thing I try to do is understand how it's organized, and I try to use that structure as we teach it. When you get to something like Proverbs, it is a hodgepodge of practical little things and lofty ideas. and all, it, it, it doesn't lend itself easily to being cataloged or organized, what have you. I think that's the Holy Spirit doing it deliberately. And one of the things, one of the characteristics of the book of Proverbs, don't laugh, I'm not being flippant here, it has 31 chapters. And we have 31 days in our months, typically. And it's been long recognized by many that you can read a chapter a day that corresponds to the date. That has an advantage. If you miss a day, you don't try to go back. You've got a chapter each, each day. And we take today's date and read that chapter, okay? But I, I want you to con- consider an experiment. Go get a log book. Go to a stationery store and get a, in this case, I'd probably, if you can find one, get a calendarized one, one that has 31 pages numbered, okay? And what you do is month number one, what you do is in the morning, read the chapter for that date. Take the date, whatever the date is, read that chapter in the morning to get, sort of be part of your devotions for the day. Be what, whatever, you're going to, whatever devotions you read, great, but include chapter X for that day. You with me so far? Then at the end of the day, take your journal and go back to that chapter and highlight the verse that really meant the most to you that day. I'm going to, I'm inferring that something happened during the day that there is a verse in that chapter that meant something special to you that day. Just annotate it. Okay? That's, you do that for a month. By the time months goes by, you've got 31 of those that you've read. For month number two, I want you to do the same thing. When you get to that page, you're now in the second month, the verse that meant the most to you that day may be a different verse. And I think if you do this for a few months, see if I'm right, I think you'll discover something very interesting. I think the day, the day's reading is like a menu. And I think the Holy Spirit will highlight a verse that's going to be important for you that day. It might be a verse that caused you to correct your behavior a little bit on some issue. It might be an encouragement in something, some task that you need a little more resolve in. It might be, uh, I don't know what it is, but that's, that's the grand adventure. When you get to a point in your walk where you feel the day-to-day involvement of the Holy Spirit in what you're doing. And the book of Proverbs gives you a mechanism to do that. And I think you're in for a personal discovery that the most relevant verse in each of those chapters will be for that day in your life, which will be different each month. Sometimes it'll be a practical thing. Sometimes it'll be a theological. It'll be different. That's, check it out and see what you think. Well, as I say, we're now in the second major section, so this kind of thing you're going to discover is going to be uh, quite a hodgepodge going here. So let's go into chapter 10, the Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is, a he- is the heaviness of his mother. And uh, that seems pretty straightforward. What you turn out to be is going to be a, a uh, crown or baggage <laughs> for your parents. Goes on, treasures of wickedness profit nothing. Treasures of wickedness profit nothing, but righteous delivereth from death. We could preach on that for an hour, but I don't think I need to. That's pretty self-evident. The, the Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish, but he casteth away the sustenance of the wicked. Wow. The Lord will not suffer the soul of the righteous to famish. Boy, am I grateful for his stewardship. I'm very skeptical of my stewardship. As I look back at my life, there's very few mistakes I've missed. Okay? He, he, be, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. Really? But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. It's interesting how often we have a supervisor that back in the cloakroom they say, boy, is he a control freak. Boy, he watches every detail. 
And, you know, people grumble about that. And obviously some of those things can be accessed. But it's interesting. The scripture says, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. If you're going to deal, if you're responsible for resources, you want to deal with it with a tight hand. You want to be on top of your details. And uh, another prophet, throughout the Proverbs, it'll echo this in different ways. The wise shepherd knows the state of his flocks. That's a call to a good accountantship. He that becometh poor dealeth with a slack hand. It's interesting that industry is not only commended, it's commanded. It's commanded. In the Bible, faith and laziness never mingle. The ones that are faithful are people who are not lazy. We're going to see other examples of, of that uh, throughout the book. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Indeed. He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causes shame. Solomon says this another way in Ecclesiastes. There's a time to work and there's a time to coast. There's a time for this and a time for that. There's a time to gather. That's the summer. And the harvest is when everybody, all hands are to turn out and help, and that's when the, 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 the loser is found a hammock somewhere in Hyden. Blessings are upon the head of the just, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. This could be translated a little better in the Hebrew. It's the mouth of the wicked covereth or concealeth violence for mischievous devices to be executed in due time. And uh, so blessings are upon the head of the just. You know, that reminds you of Samuel. But violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. And that should remind you of Saul. One of the things you can do, if you're going to, in your notes, as it occurs to you, as the Lord leads you, as you, sum, as, as you see some of these descriptions, in your margin or in your notes, pencil the people that that suggests to you. And I'm not suggesting your neighbors, particularly. They may find your notes someday. No. But uh, people in the Bible that exemplify these things. And... Uh, the contrast between Samuel on the one hand and Saul on the other is just one, one, one thing occurs, you, you can fill in others. The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. The word rot there literally means worm-eaten, meaning useless and disgusting. The wise in heart will receive commandments, but the prating fool shall fall. Or the prating fool, that's the fool of lips of wicked language is what the Hebrew really says. But you get the idea. The flavor there is pretty good. He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. And uh, he that winketh with the eye causeth sorrow, but a prating fool shall fall. Now, winks maliciously, is, is uh, an attack by innuendo, in effect. Hmm? The mouth of a righteous man is a well of life, but, the, but violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. And, uh, or the lips of the righteous shall nourish many, as the, it literally is. In the lips of him that hath understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him that is void of understanding. Straightforward. Wise men lay up knowledge, but the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. And uh, Boy, uh, a number of these places... One of the names that comes to mind, strange enough, is Rehoboam. When Solomon dies, Rehoboam takes over, and his mismanagement causes the civil war that divides the house into two houses. How tragic it is, he was the son of Solomon. He was the one that Solomon was trying to instruct with these things, but he wasn't paying attention or didn't, know how, didn't apply it properly. The labor of the righteous tendeth to life, but the fruit of the wicked is to sin. So that's all pretty straightforward. He is, he is in the way of life that keepeth instruction, but he that refuseth reproof errs. Echoing the same thoughts we've mentioned before. He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool. 
I'll come back to this one in a little bit. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. In other words, with a lot of words, you're probably not going to be short of sin. But there's a value in holding your peace. He that refraineth his lips is wise. The tongue of the just is a choice silver. The heart of the wicked is a little worth. At this point, let me pause for it. And I want to ask you a question to think about. What, in your mind, is the most painful sin? If we're going to make a list of all the kinds of sins, there's some big ones, some little ones. There's, I think, in our, at least in our mind, we, they're all sin, but some are more drastic than others. What is not the most drastic? What is the most painful sin? What sin causes more pain than any other? What sin has probably caused more pain than any other? A friend of mine that I asked that question said adultery, and that's hard to argue with. That's a toughie. But I'm going to suggest another one to, for us to consider, and it's the one that happens to be embraced by these last three verses. He that hideth hatred with lying lips and uttereth a slander is a fool. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. The tongue of the just is, is, cho is choice silver, the heart of the wicked is little worth. There is one of the commandments that we tend to underestimate. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. This clearly focuses on lying about our neighbor. But it may be a much broader application than just that. I'm talking about gossip. I'm talking about gossip. I think gossip is the most painful sin that we all deal in. It's a form of betrayal. It's probably accountable for more personal pain and suffering than most of us have any ability to appreciate. Common, casual, yet hurtful beyond our imagining. Quietly, behind the flurry of daily priorities, its venom does its silent work. What does it do? It undermines confidences, betraying relationships, spreading unseen injustices. You know, it's disturbing to really take count of how many of us have been injured deeply by gossip. And not just by those who are promoting the gossip, but also by those who accept without checking negative or derogatory innuendos whispered behind our backs. Astonishing. As many of you know our background, you know that Nan and I went through some pretty dark times about 15 years ago. I, went, uh, I, I, got, I was very over-aggressive in some projects, got what I deserved. We, en we went through a bankruptcy. The unpardonable sin. Bankruptcy. And obviously that adjustment had a lot of implications on our lives. But I can tell you candidly, the most painful part of that whole e era was the injury to us by our so-called Christian friends, with whom we were suddenly um, unclean. And the, the misunderstandings and the stories that had no basis in truth that started to circulate were injurious beyond imagining. And uh, that, that, that era alone colors my perspective here. You see, what an opportunity exists when somebody has some gossip. What an opportunity to display loyalty, love, and by assuming the most charitable construction in advance, before you have any data, demonstrate the foundation of a relationship. I'm fond of telling a little story on Walter Martin. I was on his board, and during the board meetings, there was a break in the board meetings, and Walter came up to me and a couple of others that were staying around and says, do you know what Chuck Smith said last Sunday night? He was ready to disclose something that he had. To and I stopped him right in the middle. I says, gee, Walter, what was, what was uh, Chuck's reaction when you confronted him with that? He looked at me sort of startled. And I quickly added, Walter, I know you're too biblical to be sharing that with us without having first reviewed it with Chuck. 
I mean, you wouldn't think of doing something like that. And what was Chuck's reaction? And Walter knew I had him. <laughs> he got that impish smile on his face. Didn't know quite where to turn. He said, I'm going to have trouble with you, aren't I? And we were all laughing because Walter was not. He was very diligent. He normally did not do that. And so that what was fun about this one is because we caught him. This wasn't characteristic. And so it was one of the, you sort of like catching the kid with his finger in the cookie jar, so to speak. But, uh, but how true it is, how easy it is for us to do that behind people's back. You know what the Christian version of that is? I don't want to gossip, but I want to tell you this about so-and-so that you can pray for him more specifically. You know? I'm reminded about the, uh, the three ministers that were meeting. They used to meet for lunch regularly to share and so forth. And one guy says, hey, fellas, I really I need some help. I really need prayer because I've got a real problem with pornography. I'm trying to get, I, I just need, I just need, it's, it's a difficulty. I, I confess it with you. So you pray for me and so forth. And second guy says, gee, as long as you're being that candid, I'll have to tell you if you'd pray for me too. I've got a, I've got a problem, a pecuniary problem. I, I find myself taking a little off the offering plate now and then for this, that, and the other thing. And I've got to break myself of that. It's a form of covetousness, and I just need your help. And would you pray for me? So sure. And the third guy says, gee, I, I, I have to tell you, as long as you're being candid, uh, my, my problem's gossip, but I can hardly wait to get out of here. <laughs> the New Testament also tells us the tongue is the ready and willing instrument to talk about our neighbor behind his back and the injury is enormous and uh, even Paul corrects the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12 he says for I fear lest when I come I shall not find you as I would such as I would but and that I shall uh, that I shall be found unto you such as ye would not Lest there be debates and envyings and wraths and strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults, and he goes on with the list. That doesn't describe any of our fellowships, I'm sure, but I thought I'd include it here. Leviticus 19.16 says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Notice the tales don't have to be untrue to be hurtful. Gossip does not have to be false to be injurious. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of the faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Proverbs eleven thirteen. We'll get that in, later in Proverbs. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Proverbs eighteen eight. In chapter twenty, he that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Therefore, meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Watch out for the one that the flatterer. Watch out for the flatterer. That tells there's a weakness of character that's betraying that will turn on you before it's all over. I love these three that are in uh, Proverbs 26. Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. We've all experienced that, right? But what's it really talking about? So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceases. As coals are to burning coals and wood to a fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a talebearer are as wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. There's an echo of that same perception. Remember Jesus? She, he commented on this too. Remember? Talking about the woman that caught in adultery. And thus they said, tempting him that they might accuse him. Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. We all know that. This is the only occasion we, uh, no, this is the second occasion, this is the second occasion that we find Jesus writing with his finger. Do you know that? Many people say the first, I almost said it here. That's the first, this second time was in sand. The first time he wrote with his finger was in stone in Exodus 4, or wherever, yeah, 20, Exodus 20. What is a true friend? One who doesn't require explanations. Think about that. One who gives the benefit of the doubt. I have people, I have friends in the ministry. Someone come up to you, you hear what so and so just did? I don't need to. He's my friend. Period. New paragraph. What else do you want to talk about? One who is loyal and shuns any form of betrayal. There's a, ver there's a little poem I'd like to just share with you called I Hear It Said. You'll find it in any anthology of poetry, probably, American poetry. 
Last night, my friend, he says he's my friend, came in and questioned me. I hear it said that you've done this or that. I came to ask, are these things true? A glint was in his eye of small distrust. His words were crisp and hot. He measured me with anger and flung down a little heap of facts that had come to him. I heard it said that you've done this and that. Suppose I have. And are you not my friend? And are you not my friend enough to say, if it were true, there'd be a reason in it? And if I cannot know the how and why, still I can trust you waiting for a word and, or for no word if no word ever come. Is friendship just a thing of afternoons, of pleasuring one's friend and one's dear self? Greed for sedate approval of his pace? Suspicion if he take one little turn upon the road, one flight into the air, and has not sought you for your yea or nay? No, friendship is not so. I am my own. And howsoever near my friend may draw unto my soul, there is a legend hung above a certain straight and narrow way that says, Dear my friend, ye may not enter here. I would the time has come, and it is not. When men shall rise and say, He is my friend. Has he done this? And what is that to me? Think you I have a check upon his head? Or cast a guiding rein across his neck? I am his friend. And for that cause I walk not over close beside him, leaving still space for his silences and space for mine. Thought I'd just throw that in as it's included with the course. No problem. Moving on in Proverbs 10, verse 21, The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for want of wisdom. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. It is a sport to a fool to do mischief, but a man of understanding hath wisdom. The fear of the wicked, it shall come upon him, but the desire of the righteous shall be granted. And so, when God gives you a blessing, it'll be trouble-free. When riches come bound up with some bundle of worries and fear, they can never satisfy. Riches from God don't bring with it apprehensions. And, uh, you know, if we enjoy as well as what we dislike, both of those are a measure of our character, what we enjoy and what we dislike. And uh, moving on, a whirlwind passes, and so is the wicked no more. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. You know, it's really, if you really have your heart set on eternity and our king, and you really use that as your yardstick of relevance here on the earth, boy, does that change things. Um, that which is wicked, that which is hurtful, is temporary. It's going to be gone Righteousness is an everlasting foundation. And here's, <laughs> as vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes, so is the sluggard to them that send him. <laughs> Irritations. <laughs> so is the person that dawdles. You ever send someone an errand and find him ineffectual? Well, like, it's vinegar to the teeth and as smoke to the eyes. So is the sluggard to them that send him. The fear of the Lord prolongeth his days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. Again, it's an expression of confidence in God's righteousness. The way of the Lord is a strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. The way of the Lord is strength to the upright, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. Boy, we need to have more confidence in that. The righteous shall never be removed, but the wicked shall not inhabit the earth. The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, but the froward tongue shall be cut out. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked speaketh perverseness, frowardness, perverseness. And um, it's interesting that these Proverbs link speech with consequence. Linking speech with consequence. And there's something very strange about speech. It's like toothpaste out of a tube. Boy, how many times we wish we've been a little slower because you can't put it back in the tube. Once it's out there, it's out there. Well, moving on to chapter 11. A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. You know, Leviticus 19 
forbids the use of dishonest standards. And you and I cannot be too careful in, de- in, our, in fair dealing with others. In the Talmud, it has precise prescriptions of how often, once a week, they had to you know, wipe their weights and all the, 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 the uh, procedures are very express as to how they made sure their balances that were used in commerce were fair, not depriving the, the merchant or the customer of what, 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 what was appropriate. And... Uh, False balance is abomination of the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. That obviously isn't just about scales or just about yardsticks used in commerce. It's a principle. And uh, very interesting. So I, I've had the privilege of being mentored by a number of the great men of commerce. And I won't bore you with the details, but one of the things that fascinated me to learn very early, that a transaction that's not a good deal for your adversary is not a good deal for you either. The smart guys on serious negotiations always pursue the reality check from both sides of the table. I can remember when I was at Ford Motor Company and I'd be sitting down with Ed Hayes of Kelsey Hayes about a brake problem. Our engineers would visit his plants to make sure that the fix that we decided would not only fix the problem that we're dealing with, but would also be profitable for him. We would put engineers out there to make sure that the fix was profitable. Why would we do that? Because if it wasn't, he'd cut corners later. He'd be bound to. He wouldn't try. It wouldn't be just his work. In other words, unless it's a good deal within the structure, it wouldn't, it wouldn't survive the year. So it was, it was astonishing to discover in the hard-nosed world of practical economics, the smart vendor, uh, 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 customer, you know, uh, primes, make sure their subcontractors are making. That was one of the great things when we dealt with Boeing. I was, we had a highly classified contract with Boeing, and uh, it was interesting. It was very hard to qualify to be a supplier to them, but once you're par- there, you were a partner. And they made sure that it, was, it would work out for both sides. It was, there were no such things as one-sided deals within the family, so to speak. Anyway, moving on. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Boy, when pride cometh. There's pride. Pride lurks throughout this book as an adversary. When pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. The integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. You know, it's astonishing to me, I could also give you some Wall Street examples of people who were crooked. And it was interesting to see cases, I could give you anecdotal cases, where their own perverseness is what was their own undoing. Their own undoing. It's hard to talk about this without talking of specifics, and that would be gossip, so I'll move on. <laughs> okay. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. That's pretty straightforward. The righteousness of the perfect, or complete, shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. There again is an echo of the same principle. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but the transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. And when you see the word wicked, you can also substitute the word lawless. Same thing would fit. When a wicked man dieth, his expect, expectation shall perish, but the hope of unjust men perisheth. <laughs> and you can't read this, these, some of these without thinking of Haman. Remember Haman and his contriving to, to get Mordecai uh, and how that all boomeranged on him where he was hung as your translation would have it, he was hung on the very gallows that he had erected for Mordecai in, a, in, a, in, a, in an eloquent, delightful, dramatic uh, ellipsis there. There's a translational problem. They weren't gallows. They were piercings. The Persians used piercings, crucifixions. But the, uh, I won't get into that here. Okay. Um, and uh, the righteous are delivered out of trouble. A hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Now, the hypocrite is, uh, is uh, well, we know what hypocrites are. Let's see, okay. uh, uh, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, when I think of hypocrites, see, the term actually comes from the theater. You know, speak, and yet, uh, how interesting it is how that also characterize, characterizes the entertainment industry. Um, I have a, a personal theory that when you spend your energies, uh, your career, pretending to be somebody else, you may lose control of who you really are. 
But when it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoiceth. And when the wicked perish, there is shouting. Why is that true? Why is it that when the righteous things go well, the city rejoices? And when the wicked perish, there is shouting. Why is that? Because our conduct affects everybody. If you're a businessman producing a profit in your enterprise, the whole community is benefiting by it. And uh, when you see uh, an a, a enterprise properly run and prospering, that, it, that, has, that, that creates a well-being for the customers that benefit by those products and services, by the employees who have employment, by the suppliers who have a customer, etc. Peter Drucker, one of the most prolific management writers uh, of our day, uh, 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 pointed out that to create a product not making a profit should be a sin, should be a crime. If I have a cup here that's a product, and let's assume there's a dollar's worth of material, and let's assume there was a dollar's worth of labor to go in that cup, if I sell that cup for less than two dollars, that's a crime because I won't stay in business. It's a crime to my customers. Who won't, I won't be there when they come back for more. I won't be there for my suppliers who, have, who need a place to sell the plastic or whatever. I, I, won't be there, I, I won't be returning a proper return to my investors who got behind me so, uh, and my employees who are helping me are going to be without a job. You ever stop to think about that, that, that profit to make this, the, the, this if, if I, it takes a dollar worth of material and a dollar worth of mat- uh, uh, labor, if I don't sell it for more two dollars, I'm, I'm destroying value. Because in separate, they're worth a dollar each. If I put them together, they're le- worth less than two dollars. I've, econ- I've created an economic crime. And it's astonishing how many people don't understand that, that uh, healthy enterprises are essential for a healthy community. What goes well with the righteous, I'm not talking about cheating, I'm not talking about you know, uh, inappropriate behavior, I'm talking about just a healthy, well-managed enterprise is a blessing to the community, to the employees, to the customers, to the suppliers, to the investors that are involved. So when it goes well with the righteous, the city of Georgia, and when the wicked perish, there's shouting for lots of reasons. But anyway, <laughs> by the blessing of the upright, the city is exalted, but is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. They all flow. You get the, I, I don't have to, to uh, see, the, bear in mind too, you know, the businessman is the one that's going to be supporting the, uh, employing others, supporting the schools and the government with his taxes. And, and, uh, uh, and in the Old Testament tradition especially, he shares his generosity. Okay, verse 12, he that is void, devoid, he that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. Again, there's that gossip overtone in it. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but that he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. We talked about that earlier. Where no counsel is, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors there is safety. Boy, that's important. You have an issue or an idea, there is a benefit in getting a multitude of advice. In a multitude of counselors there is safety. Where there is no counsel, the people fall. Boy, how tragic it is. We're experiencing that at the, on, at, at the national level. We have an incredibly misguided foreign policy, or lack thereof, lack of any policy. Our present administration is in, in, in far cry uh, more righteous than the previous one, on the one hand. On the other hand, it has put us on a collision course with God. And so we watch that with obviously great concern. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. We're getting some, some very key people in key places are getting very bad advice, unfortunately. He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it, and he that hateth suretyship is sure. This echoes some things we talked about in that first chapter. My Jewish friends explained to me what a guarantor is. That's a schmuck with a pen, you know. <laughs> a gracious woman retaineth honor, and a strong man retain wit- riches. A gracious woman retaineth honor. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. See, all these things come back. The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. This is a commitment to sound, solid uh, commitments. 
He that soweth right shall be a sure reward. The righteous tendeth to life, and so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. They that are of a froward or perverse heart are an abomination to the Lord. Boy, that's a, that's a scary phrase. To be an abomination to the ruler of the universe? Man, doesn't get any worse than that. But sure as are upright in their way are his delight. You know, that's so neat. You know, if you've ever been in a large organization and you suddenly discover that there's now a new, new chief executive running the company, everybody in the company tries to figure out who is he, what's his background, what are his likes and dislikes, what kinds of things please him, what kinds of things don't please him. Organizations sometimes overtly, sometimes just instinctively will work hard on that issue. They want to understand his buying habits, right? Well, it would behoove us to really understand the ruler of the universe because he's involved in our lives. And we know that his, our heart, if it's the wrong place, are an abomination to him, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. Isn't that, isn't that neat to at least understand that? Let's do something about it. Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. As a jewel of gold, oh, this, is, this is a classic. As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman, which is without discretion. Isn't that a gem of a proverb? Eloquent. It's got that sort of, those elements to make it easy to remember. Now, can you think of an example? Boy, I sure can. Pick up, in fact, don't, but I was going to say pick up at your, news, at your checkout counter a copy of any one of the magazines that are tracking the celebrities of Hollywood. And here you have gals who are exquisitely beautiful that are totally without discretion. Have, it's, you, know, you want an example? Um, our entertainment industry, merchandise, merchandise examples of fair women, attractive women, who are without discretion. Their lives are tragic. In every, in, every, in every respect. The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth, and there is that which holdeth more than is meat, but tendeth to poverty. And uh, it's interesting how there are people that um, uh, are very generous, and they prosper. And there are people that are misers, and they end up in poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, but he that watereth shall be watered also himself. He that withholdeth corn, the people shall curse him. But blessing shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. And you can't talk about this. You want a contrast here. Let me give you two contrasts. One is Nabal in 1 Samuel 30, uh, 25 that we talked about, where he denied just meager things for David and almost, you know, and his wife sort of bailed that situation out. But the point is, Nabal, and, in, and the word in Hebrew means fool, by the way. But the other, the contrast example is Joseph in Egypt, where his leadership and his prime ministership of, uh, became virtually the ruler of the major empire of that, that world. And, and uh, by being a blessing to the entire nation. He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor, and he that seeketh mischief, it shall come up unto him. And there are lots of examples of that. He that trusteth in riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. Are the righteous trusting in riches? Of course not. They're trusting in the Lord. That doesn't mean they won't be rich, but their, tr not, their trust isn't in the riches, it's in the Lord. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. The fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. The inherit the wind, very tragic phrase. That phrase became the name of a very famous movie, which is a totally deceitful movie. It purports to uh, uh, dramatize the Scopes trial. And, and uh, what it actually does is, is uh, gives a perverted presentation of that. People who've gone back and looked at the transcripts of that trial and so forth are shocked at how different the actual proceedings were in contrast to the way the movie portrays it. So just be aware of that. I don't get into all that here. A very, very deceitful movie, but strangely a very prophetic title. 
Because indeed, because of the Darwin thing, we are inheriting the wind. But uh, don't confuse that the use of that title with that movie as being an anywhere near accurate rendition of the Scopes trial, which it purports to do. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very misleading piece of drama. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Proverbs 11.30, very key thing. He that winneth souls is wise. You want to be in that camp. You want to be wise. By the time you get through Proverbs, you'll understand that you don't want to be a scorner, a, a, a fool, or a simple one. You want to be wise. And one of, the, one of the characteristics of the wise is that you have a burden for souls. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. Now, they'll also be recompensed, but not the way they're expecting to be. And there is an inescapable appointment that the judgment day will come, the ultimate day of reckoning. Let's get through 12. Whoso liveth, loveth instruction, loveth knowledge. He that hateth reproof is brutish. A good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. I don't think there's any surprises in any of these. It's just one of emphasis. A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. That's again the building on stone rather than quicksand kind of model, if you will. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. I think all of us know of couples like this, where there's been a marriage, where there's a virtuous woman that's just literally a crown to the husband and, 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 a, and a blessing to, to all those around her. We also, I think, know people where there's a woman that is a tragic baggage from his point of view in terms of what he's gotten into. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. No surprise. The words of the wicked are to lie and wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. The wicked are overthrown and are not, but the house of the righteous shall stand. And there again, that same echoing that previous idea. A man shall be con commended according to his wisdom, but he that is of perverse heart shall be despised. Pretty straightforward stuff. He that is despised hath a servant is better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread. In other words, uh, well, it speaks for itself. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Interesting on verse 10 here, there is a place in the Bible to be kind to animals. Right here. The righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. I get debates from some people on that, but there it is. He that tilleth his land shall be satisfied with bread. He that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. Boy, we should be uh, careful, the people that we associate with. The wicked desireth the net of evil men, but the root of the righteous yieldeth fruit. The wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him. You know, all the way through here, it's interesting, so many of these at first seem so obvious, it's almost hard to want to elaborate them because they're so, so conspicuously obvious, and yet, we live in a culture that has disconnected character and destiny. Most of us that are older were brought up in a culture that the dream was if you worked hard and played it straight, you would be destined for success. That's not taught today. The way you get, a, you get ahead is to figure out how far you can bend the law without breaking it, and so forth. Different world. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. He's lacking external counsel. The fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. You know, it's a, it would be interesting to catalog how many of these deal with the tongue. Not just slander and, and gossip, but in other ways too. But the tongue of the wise is health. The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil, but to the counselors of peace is joy. These are pithy summaries. 
There shall no evil happen to the just, but the wicked shall be filled with mischief. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. The prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. It's interesting that the wise men sort of hold a lot to themselves. And the ones that are shouting and thumping drums are foolishness often. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. And uh, I think what's also really clear as you try to summarize these things is that Proverbs always take the eternal, the long-term perspective. Not the near-term expedient, but the long-term perspective. They, they advocate a path that is the path you would have chosen if you were at the end of the road looking back that you wish you'd t- you, you wished you would have taken. Heaviness in the heart of a man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduces them. And uh, see, the righteous really searches out his neighbor to help him is the, is the thought that's behind this. And while the wicked will try to hurt his neighbor, take advantage of him, the righteous one is seeking him out, how he can help him, and the wicked one is, is, uh, is trying to, to uh, take advantage of him. But verse 27 is the ultimate laziness. You hunters will appreciate this. The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. You know, it's interesting. This slothful man is so lazy that he didn't want to even bother fixing and dressing and, and, and killing the deer he caught. That's lazy. But the substance of a dil- diligent man is... A diligent man is going to treat what he has as precious, however small it might be. In the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. Now that's a promise. That's a, that's a promise. Okay, a wise son heareth his father's instruction, but a scorner heareth not rebuke. A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressor, uh, transgressor shall eat violence. He that keepeth his mouth keepeth his life, but he that openeth wide his lips shall have destruction. Boy, there's an... uh, Keep your mouth shut, huh? I should take that one to heart. Okay. The soul of a slugger desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Diligence is called for throughout the Scripture. A righteous man hateth lying, but a wicked man is loathsome and cometh to shame. Righteous keepeth him that is upright in their way, and a wickedness overthroweth a sinner. There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. And there is that that maketh himself poor, and hath great riches. And literature is full of examples of that. Of people that work to be rich and really end up with nothing, and those that are, would seem at first to be poor, but actually have great riches and people, and relationships, and, and the value of their life. The ransom of man's life is, are his riches, but the poor heareth not rebuke. The light of the, light of the righteous rejoiceth, but the lamp of the wicked shall be put out. Now, verse 10 is one of these gems in my mind. Only by pride cometh contention, but with, well, with the well-advised is wisdom. When you see contention, you know that the root of that is pride on somebody's part. Only by pride cometh contention. That's one of the problems I have with debates, by the way. A lot of people want me to debate some doctrinal issue with some other with a different view, and I, don't, I usually don't participate in those. I'm perfectly willing to discuss it with people who want answers. But usually debates are really contentions, and pride is, uh, surfaces to, uh, to interfere with the process in my mind. That's just a prejudice I have. But only by pride cometh the that's, that's a gem. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when desire cometh, it is a tree of life. Wow. Um, by the way, uh, back on verse 11, the, um, this is really the source of what's sometimes called a spendthrift trust or generation skipping trusts. Because people of all kinds have known through life that inherited wealth seems to evaporate very quickly. The guys that make it and the guys that can keep it are two different talents altogether. And uh, so the, the track record, the stewardship track record of second generation money is pretty dismal. And uh, that's what leads to this, uh, th- those, those kind of legal techniques to skip generations and so forth. And uh, 
Who shall despise that the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. Fair enough. The law of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. And every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth open his folly. Pretty straightforward stuff all the way through here. A wicked messenger falleth into mischief, but a faithful ambassador is health. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. There again is the, that echoes in my mind the Edmund Spencer idea. You know, that uh, you want to be a listener, you want to be open to instruction. The people who uh, regard reproof will, will grow and, and benefit by it. It's interesting to look at ministries too, and you'll notice that the ministries that have been successful are ministries where the principal is responsive to a board of directors. Not a rubber stamp board, but real counselors to whom that will hold them accountable. And I'm grateful to be surrounded by people that I, I have no problem hearing and listening to. The desire accomplished is sweet to the soul, but it is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. So, you know, it's a... It's a uh, you know, it's interesting to realize how the world of the flesh, the world itself, operates by undertaking compromising, compromising information. It's astonishing to realize how much power in politics hangs on making sure that the person that's going to be your adversary doesn't have clean hands. One of the great tragedies of some of the administration changeovers is that the new party coming in didn't have enough clean hands to go back and hold the previous people accountable. Big tragedy. Big tragedy. Evil pursueth sinners, but the righteous good shall be repaid. The good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. And the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Interesting. Much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that destroyed for want of judgment. He that spareth the rod hateth his son. Woo wee. He that spareth the rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chaseth him betimes. That doesn't mean you spank him in anger, but it does mean you discipline, not punish. Discipline the child. Big difference, but important too. The righteous eateth to the satisfying of his soul, but the belly of the wicked shall have want. One more chapter, and we'll call it an evening. Every wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. How many of you know a woman that is destroying her own home? If you look at Sarah and Jochebed, there's good examples in the Bible. And contrary wise, you've got Isaiah's mother, Athaliah, which really brought down the whole house of Ahab, strangely enough. There are women that build their house, but the stupid women are the ones that pluck down their own house, not realizing what they're doing, disparaging their husbands, tearing down their, the edifice upon which her future will depend. He that walketh in his uprightness feareth the Lord. He that is perverse in his ways despiseth him. In the mouth of the foolish is a rod of pride, Ooh. but the lips of the wise shall preserve them. Where no, oh, this one, by the way, this one, verse 4, is posted on my the door to my study. I put this, I li I li it literally is on my door. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But much increases by the strength of the ox. The concept behind this, of course, if you've got a brand new clean, if the stable's really clean, then you don't, you, don't have a, you don't have any animal of production in it. And uh, so I excuse this debris pile that I call my study on the basis of productivity. Actually, I just travel too much to keep it up, but I've got to, it's, 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 become, it's become a proverb within the ministry that I've got to straighten that out. But where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but by, by much increases the strength of the ox. Okay, a faithful witness will not lie, but a false witness will utter lies. A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not, but knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. Indeed, a scorner seeketh wisdom, but findeth it not. But knowledge is easy in him that understandeth. Go from the presence of the foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. Wow. That's interesting. Don't cast your pearls before the swine, the Lord tells us. That goes so against the grain of some of us who sort of feel it's our job to enlighten the ones that don't want to be enlightened. It is our job to declare the truth, but it's not our job to get them to understand. 
Go from the presence of the foolish man when thou perceivest not in him lips of knowledge. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. The folly of fools is deceit. Fools make a mock at sin, but among the righteous there is favor. The heart knoweth his own bitterness, and a stranger doth not intermeddle with his joy. Hmm. The house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. There is, and this is another verse, verse 12 of chapter 14. You'll find several times throughout the Proverbs, literally the same verse. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Boy, is that a danger signal. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man. Seems okay in terms of human judgment. But the end thereof are the ways of death. That description is repeated throughout the book of Judges as a description of how far they fell. Because they're using their own yardstick, not the yardstick of God. And that's exactly what our culture has done when we outlaw the teaching of God in the schools and even in our courtrooms. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful, but the, at the end of that mirth is heaviness. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. The simple believeth every word, but the prudent man looketh well to his going. The wise man feareth and departeth from evil, but the fool rageth and is confident. Again, you see the contrast of the... Of the uh, the scorner, the fool, the simple, with the wise men, all the way through here. He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. He that is soon angry deals foolishly. Boy, how, how valuable it is to have self-control. To, to, uh, we'll talk more about that as we go forward in Proverbs. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. The evil bow before the good, and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The poor is hated even of his own neighbor. But the rich hath many friends. Isn't that the truth? Yeah, it was, a, it was astonishing to us to discover um, how many of our friends seemed to disappear. Friends we had when we had money, when we were on top of the world financially, uh, Christian friends, and how quickly you become uh, uh, abandoned. The good news, so I don't leave that hanging, is that we were surrounded by people we'd never met before that became our board and our supporters and and uh, showed, uh, showed this, you know, real commitment to Nan and I during those dark days. He that despiseth his neighbor sinneth, but he that hath mercy on the poor, happy is he. Do they not err that devise evil? But mercy and truth shall be to them that devise good. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. Talk's cheap, is what it says. Talk is cheap. And... Uh, the crown of the wise is the riches, but the foolishness of fools is folly. And it's a, a true witness delivereth souls, but a deceitful witness speaketh lies. Jesus said that another way. He says, if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall in the ditch. That's another way of expressing, I think, pretty much a similar thought. In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, in his, and his children shall have a place of refuge. Fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. In the multitude of people is the king's honor. But in the want of people is the destruction of the prince. Interesting. In the multitude of people of the king's honor. Do you realize that in the ancient empires, abortions were a capital crime? If parents were caught killing a baby, they were executed. Because it was considered a crime against the state. Why? Because the power of the state was its population. And the growth rate in those days, was an a recognized as an asset. And to interfere with that process was considered by these ancient cultures, pagan cultures. I'm not talking about the... They also indulged in some other things too, but the point is, it's interesting they recognized that as, as a crime against the state. In the multitude of people is the king's honor, but in the want of people, or the lack of people, is the destruction of the prince. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding, and he that is hasty of spirit executes folly. Here again, go slow. There's a great value in somehow holding your peace and cooling off. He that is slow to wrath is of great understanding. He that is hasty of spirit executes folly, ex exalted folly. The sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy is the rottenness of the bones. Boy, envy. Envy will not only rob you of your joy and your fellowship in the Lord, it will also affect you physically. Physically. 
I think all of us probably have know examples of people whose lives were ultimately just destroyed by a long-standing envy of some kind, bitterness. A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy, the rottenness of the bones. That's very literally true. He that oppresseth the poor reproaches his maker. He that oppresses the poor reproaches his maker, but he that honoreth him hath mercy on the poor. Your, re- your reaction or relationship to the poor reflects your attitude in terms of the fear of God. The wicked is driven away by his wickedness, but the righteous hath hope in his death. Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that hath understanding, but that which is in the midst of fools is made known. And we're almost through righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Boy, I wish this verse was put over the United Nations rather than the one they took, which is about beating their swords into plowshares. Why? Because that will happen when Christ comes and not before then. But boy, righteousness exalteth the nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. It's astonishing to realize how much of the immorality and, and uh, lack of integrity among our young people are echoes of the conduct of the previous administration. It's just a reality. I, some people say you're making a partisan comment. I guess I am because I'm, I'm taking it from the point of view of our king. The king's favor is toward the wise servant, but his wrath is against him that causeth shame. Okay, we, let's, for next time, read chapters 15 through 20. And one of the things I encourage you to do in your notes as you do that, try to think of examples from the lives in the Bible of the ones that echo. Many of the same thoughts will echo. There'll be some fresh ones, and we'll deal with that next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. <laughs> Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the joy that you allow us as we gather. We do pray, Father, that these words would indeed illuminate the path before us, that we indeed might take these to heart, that we might be ever more effective stewards of the opportunities before us. We do pray, Father, that you would just illuminate that path, guide us, feed us, strengthen us, as we commit ourselves afresh to be wise as you define wisdom, as we commit all of this in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.